Our speaker for the day, and I think that this one is important, is uh, Douglas McQueen from the Plan of Ryan Law. He's going to talk to us today about some of the legal considerations for uh, the use of an uh, aircraft, and I think give us some insight into things we should look out for. Please welcome Mr. Douglas McQueen.
what form is your business going to take? Are you going to form uh, just a sole proprietorship? Is it going to be a corporation? Do you want to do, depending on the state you're in, a limited liability partnership, LLC, whatnot? Uh, God forbid it may even be a nonprofit. Uh, <coughs> that, that could definitely be a possibility. Perhaps it's not in the business. Perhaps what you're interested in doing is acquiring an already existing business or spinning off part of the business that you already have. Uh, and the issue that comes up very often in these acquisition and divestitures is due diligence inquiries. Uh, not only do attorneys help you handle those due diligence inquiries, but very often we get involved in disputes regarding the adequacy or sometimes the alleged inadequacy of those due diligence inquiries. Uh, financing is another area. All new businesses, almost all new businesses, are going to need seed money to get started. Uh, and it's a question of how and where that seed money comes from. We heard a lot of people speaking yesterday about uh, uh, obtaining seed money from venture capitalists. And of course, there we, we would always look out for how much control you may be seeding uh, in exchange for that venture capital and whether or not that control that you might seed in your business has an effect on, even on your corporate form. Uh, last, I put loans versus investments, and this is a common law school 101 dilemma. Uh, I think everyone's heard of this scenario at one time or another. Um, you have an ambitious young nephew who goes to his uncle and says, I need $50,000 to start up a business. And of course, the generous uncle gives it to him. A year and a half later, uh, after the business perhaps hasn't gone so well, the uncle says, I'd like my loan back. The nephew, of course, says, well, that wasn't a loan, it's an investment, and I'm sorry, the money's gone. Of course, there's the flip side of that transaction where same uncle gives $50,000, and a year and a half later, the business is just booming. Nephew turns around, writes a check for the capital plus a little bit of the interest, and says, hey, thanks for the loan. And the uncle says, that wasn't a loan, I invested in your business. Now, of course, it's really important to make sure that you clarify those issues right at the beginning of of the entrepreneurial process right at the beginning when you're undertaking that transaction. <coughs> Have it clear, avoid those disputes in the future. After that, we'll move on to what's called, what I would call the ongoing transactional issues. Um, that's getting down to the business of doing what it is you do. And for the most part, that's going to, uh, that's going to involve contracts. And as with every contract, we always just ask, uh, the biggest issue is what did the parties agree to? You'd be amazed at some of the contract disputes that we see in our practice where uh, we have a hard time, even after a careful analysis, trying to figure out what did these parties agree to? Uh, and a lot of times it takes more work later for us to untangle the mess than it would have been had we been involved in trying to set out that contract correctly in the first place. Uh, I won't go down a whole list here. I won't take too much of the time. But well, one thing I wanted to point out was the uniqueness on the bottom there of government contracts. Some people talked about it yesterday, and it certainly is true that doing business with a government entity is certainly a, a unique animal in and of itself. It can involve aspects of sovereign immunity and also doing business, as some of you may wish to do, at, in service contracts to public agencies. That's going to involve uh, indemnity, where you're going to have to provide full coverage and full protection for the government agency uh, for whom you work. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that, sometimes working with an attorney and or an insurance company can help you get through that process. Another area is intellectual property. I don't need to tell the tech-savvy people in this room anything about protecting the fruits of their labor. Of course, that's something you want to do. Uh, a good IP attorney can help you, however, uh, to arrange uh, licensing agreements so that your copyrights, your patents, and your trademarks can be put to productive use. Often those licensing agreements are found in franchising agreements, and some of you, if you're not already involved in franchising whatever business you're starting, you probably have in the back of your head, hey, someday when I get this idea up and rolling, I'd love to franchise. Insurance. Now here's a bit of a sidebar. In our aviation practice, we work very closely uh, with the aviation insurance industry. Uh, 
Uh, over the last year, we've met with a number of the major aviation insurers in the United States. And I can tell you this about insurance of the UAV industry. They really like to be involved in this industry. Uh, and I know that a lot of people view insurance as a necessary evil. Uh, but what I hope that you'll come away with today is that rather than view insurance as a necessary evil, they really start to look at it as a risk mitigation tool. Um, insurance uh, is going to help the industry mature and flourish. Once the regulations are in place, uh, the insurance industry, uh, when we have policies in place, you know, mitigate the risk and you're going to see uh, a lot broader use of UAVs because of the availability of insurance. Uh, now, in order for the underwriters to underwrite insurance, they need to know a couple of things. First, as we talked about in, in fairly great detail yesterday, they're going to need to understand the nature of the regulations. Of course, they're not fully in place yet, but once they have an understanding of how the regulations are in place, the other thing they're going to need to know is what type of operations are you proposing to put UAVs to use? What type of things are you going to be doing with them? And it's important that you communicate that, especially in the beginning with your insurance broker if you're dealing directly with an underwriter. They, they have a clear understanding of exactly what you're going to be doing. Um, a couple points about insurance. Um, uh, based on some things that I heard yesterday, one point is that insurance companies cannot underwrite activities that are not legal. Um, now that's not to say that if you have an insurance policy in your hand that that's some kind of <coughs> the insurance company that they think it's legal. An analogy that I could make there is that you could have a car insurance policy, but it certainly doesn't mean that you could take your car out and enter it in a stock car race and you're going to have insurance coverage. Um, especially if it's an illegal stock car race on the road. But the risk you run there is that you could run into an issue where the insurer um, tries to make a denial of coverage claim because the activity that you're undertaking isn't fully legal. Almost all policies have uh, exclusions for activity that is extra legal, we'll say, if it's not in compliance with local regulations, state, federal, uh, other policies. So it's important to understand that uh, first the regs need to be in place, then the insurance market can flourish, and then you'll have valid insurance where you won't run into any of these issues. Uh, speaking of regulations, regulatory compliance, I know that the regulations that we're all waiting for are long overdue, um, and even when they do come out, as Ted said yesterday, they're going to be fairly dynamic for the first couple of years. You may want some help in your operation day to day, you may want some help in making sure that your operation is compliant with whatever regulations there are, if there are changes to those regulations, that you do what you need to do to remain compliant. Um, I won't cover any of the standards. Uh, Ted covered those yesterday. We discussed them regarding uh, ASTM and the actual standards of where the regulations might be going. Uh, but I will say this about the standards. The standards are going to become important benchmarks for uh, the standard of care in tort liability uh, determinations. So when we do end up, if there is a, a, a lawsuit involving uh, a loss of uh, damage to property, injury, <coughs> God forbid, uh, the regulations will become the standard of care. A couple areas that we did talk about yesterday, so I won't go over them too much. Um, but I plan to talk about it for the presentation. Uh, ITAR, a couple people talked about it yesterday, so most of us that were here discussed it yesterday are familiar that that affects uh, manufacturers and sellers of um, military and defense related products if you're selling those products overseas. That's the uh, international traffic uh, trade, with international traffic and arms regulations. And uh, those items are found on the U.S. munitions list. And uh, if you have any confusion about whether or not that's applicable, getting good legal counsel in that area can help you. It's not that ITAR regulations are completely going to prevent you from doing business overseas. It certainly presents a hurdle, and uh, if you need help overcoming that hurdle, we can certainly help you do that. 
Uh, but another area that we didn't talk about yesterday, somewhat related, is the, the FCPA, it's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, the FCPA is directed at ensuring that American companies doing business abroad don't engage in activities that are otherwise illegal. What we're really talking about here is bribes and kickbacks. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you are, I'll uh, take it out of the uh, UAV context, you are a uh, seller of helicopters. And you're selling helicopters to uh, an official in a Central American company. And every time you go to sell a helicopter, um, you meet this government official in a hotel room in a Central American country and he shows up with a briefcase full of cash. Um, kind, of, kind of picking up on what's going on here. I'll, I'll lay it out a little clearer. Um, you realize that with a little bit of inquiry, you could figure out that this Central American company really doesn't have any need for these helicopters. And then you also realize that with a little bit more inquiry, that this Central American country may be taking those helicopters and reselling them at a 30% loss. What's going on here? Anyone? Money laundering. It's a money laundering operation. And under the FCPA, if you're doing that kind of business overseas, you actually have an affirmative obligation to do a due diligence inquiry to make sure that you're not participating in a money laundering operation. Um, so going back to where you could get help, that due diligence inquiry, um, God forbid you've already found yourself on the uh, defensive end of an FCPA violation, but you could keep yourself out of trouble by doing that due diligence inquiry beforehand. Another area where you may find uh, legal counsel effective is in the area of risk assessment. Uh, depending on the size of your operation, some larger operations might actually have obligations to uh, enact SMS safety management systems programs, um, and you may be, have other types of safety training obligations. Some operations choose to conduct external uh, safety audits I know we deal with uh, operators all the time that engage outside companies like Wyvern to do outside safety audits. And as we see the UAV industry mature, you might find those type of audits either desirable or necessary. Or finally, you might have certain obligations under your government contracts to, to conduct certain either safety training or safety audits. And we can help you not only manage that audit process, but make sure that you're in compliance with whatever your obligations are. The next area is litigation. This is when something that we pointed out in the prior slides has obviously gone wrong. Um, it's the dreaded, you have been served type of letters. So, and litigation can come up in the context of all manner of disputes. Uh, I've just listed a couple of them here. I won't go through all of them, but I'll point out some highlights of things maybe that we see going on in the UAV field. Um, typically, and I think it was Chad that was up yesterday, mentioned this, typically what we think you're going to see is that the UAV operator is almost always going to be liable for the harm involved to uninvolved third parties and property on the ground, regardless of whether or not the UAV operator's conduct was negligent, and there we're just talking about strict liability. Um, with strict liability, in that case, what you're looking at is the need for insurance as a risk mitigation tool in order to control risks that you can't otherwise take care of. Uh, and that, again, that's another area where insurance is important. Uh, I mentioned already that the shape of the regulations is going to have an effect on how litigation proceeds in another aspect where the shape of the regulations is going to be important is the area of federal preemption. We're going to have to have a look not only at the wording of the, re the uh, regulations, but also the congressional intent underlying the legislation to determine whether or not federal standards are going to fully preempt state standards in a negligence action. We as defense attorneys kind of prefer that, we like dealing nationally with one set of very clear standards as opposed to running around the country dealing with 50 different state and common law based standards of care in, in a negligence case. Usually the plaintiff's attorneys would rather have the flexibility and freedom to uh, pick whatever is more advantageous to them. We can defend you better if we can make a preemption argument. 
Um, and preemption may apply not only to the operation of the aircraft, but also to uh, products liability and the design standards as well. Uh, speaking of products liability, uh, we do think in the beginning that the state-of-the-art defense might be available to you if uh, someone later on in litigation proposes that there was a better alternative design. You may have the defense available by saying that at the time, uh, the technology that was incorporated in the product, or the design of the product, was the best that it could possibly be. There were no other reasonable alternatives available. Um, also, regarding products liability, there may be opportunities to assert what are called sophisticated user defenses or learned intermediary defenses, where a manufacturer sells a product to someone who has specific knowledge and training about the use of that product, and as a manufacturer, you're somewhat shielded. However, I do want to caution you that those inquiries are very fact-specific and they're not going to keep you out of the courthouse. Um, the, those inquiries are, you're going to have to go and make a very fact-specific inquiry. You're not going to be able to get out of a lawsuit on summary judgment, let's say. You're going to find yourself uh, going into court to try and prove a very fact-specific inquiry that the people that you sold the product to and then maybe someone else was harmed down the road that the people that you initially sold the product to were either sophisticated users or learned intermediaries. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. I would not rely on that terribly heavily as a defense, as a products manufacturer to just say, we're selling to people that are very smart, we don't have any obligation to them. Um, overall, unfortunately, I do have to tell you this, you, just like Chad explained yesterday with the advent of the automobile and around the turn of the last century, you can expect the litigation context to be a little bit hostile to UAVs at first, um, and that's why we'll be there to try and help you out and support you um, in that context. Before I answer any questions, uh, I just want to reiterate again, our firm represents a broad spectrum of industries uh, in a broad range of legal areas. We have 22 offices in multiple states, including offices here in California, in fact, one of my partners from our office right here in downtown San Francisco, Mr. Park, is in the back of the room. So uh, I'm going to pitch some of the questions off to here uh, if he's willing to, to do that. Uh, but yesterday, Gretchen West from AUVSI mentioned the uh, 2013 AUVSI financial report. And if, if any of you have read that financial report, in that report it listed the 10 states where AUVSI predicts that we're going to see the most economic impact from the UAV industry. And uh, I'm happy to say that we have offices in most of those states. So geographically, we have your industry covered. Uh, we're trying to learn more every day. That's why we're here. That's why we wanted to come to this event. We agreed to sponsor it. We're trying to learn everything we can about your industry and make sure that we understand what it is that you do and we're here to support you. Uh, we're interested in what you do. Uh, we'll try and have the expertise to support you. You can have a look at our website. My phone number is here on the bottom. Go to our website. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Again, I will find someone who's got an answer to your question if I don't have it. That's all I have. Thanks. Potential liability claims or other claims being denied on the basis of commercial operation of the UAV. And you know, earlier, late last year, early this year, I went through the exercise of trying to isolate my new era of photography. I tried to isolate my business by creating a separate LLC, do the flying activities on the advice of an insurance agent, and then got liability coverage which you know, they insisted was the company that had written those policies. Uh, fortunately, I had to test that, but um, I'm concerned because I just wonder whether all I'm doing is basically for my own identity. I have clients who have asked me for riders for insurance, which I've, of course, been able to provide, but my fear is that they're not worth the paper printed on. Uh, well, I wouldn't say they're not worth the paper printed on. The question is about the catch-22 of uh, Having an insurance policy, someone's underwritten an insurance policy when the activity that the operator is proposing to conduct may not be legal yet. 
Um, as a lot of people have heard described, it's in a gray area. Okay, we'll call it a gray area. Um, but it may not be so simple that, that it's not worth it to the paper it's written on, because what you would have there, unfortunately, is a bad faith dispute with an insurer who took your check, they knew what your business was involved in, and certainly they don't want to just outright deny coverage if, if you're going to then make a bad faith claim against them that they sold you something knowing that they were going to refuse the coverage. Uh, so I think if someone put the policy out there, you might, at least at first, in your first claim, they might realize you're going to have a bad faith claim. From then on, you may have a, a, a problem with that policy. They might say, hey, look, now that we understand a little more, we're going to cover that one and we're not going to do anything else. And as you said, certainly you're getting the benefit of having that policy because it's satisfying people that you work with. I don't want to comment either way at this point about the actual operation that you're doing. Um, I don't think it's really in my purview in this audience to do that, but um, you see how it does raise the issues. It, it, but it doesn't necessarily avoid the value of the policy. Ted? Yeah, just a comment on that question. Uh, I'm over in Europe. I'm not going to answer the question and tell you what to do. 
In fact, in fact, let's just say this is not a long yeah. like you answer the question. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and it just really, look, it drives home the point. We need these regulations in place. Personally, my personal opinion, I think that agriculture is the absolute best way right now to burst the bubble from the bottom, create a carve out on the bottom for agriculture. The, uh, the FAA can do it um, fairly quickly. There's not a lot of potential harm in you guys have been out on those farms, you know what it's like out there, it's pretty wide open. It's empty for the most part. There's not a lot of potential for harm. So it would be the perfect area if the FAA wanted to get into this slope to open up the market a little bit at a time by opening up agriculture. We already did it for hobby and recreational purposes. All we have to do is kind of advance a little further. Um, Ted could probably talk my ear off about standards in that regard. I totally understand it. But I think just as far as process, that would be a good way to get into it. And, and I wish it would happen tomorrow, trust me. That is. I have a question about the FAA. Do you think that there's going to be able to claim exclusive jurisdiction for the FAS, like they do standard deviation? Uh, is there some of uh, there's a congressman that says California that's putting uh, legislation forward to include the FAS in privacy with uh, legislation for the state of California and individual issues? Well, you, you, you actually thrown out a couple different issues there. They're both great issues. Um, the first is, uh, let, the first word I heard, keyword there, is Congress and legislation. So with Congress, Congress's action and legislation, they certainly could change the FAA's jurisdiction, but assuming they don't go that far to do it. Um, remember, the FAA has exclusive jurisdiction over um, operational and safety issues, um, but they really don't have exclusive jurisdiction over, uh, under what act would they have jurisdiction over privacy and uh, Fourth Amendment search, search and seizure issues? They really don't, and states can actually get involved in that and have been, as we know, uh, extensively. So, um, sure, in the operational areas, the FAA's got exclusive jurisdiction. Congress could change that. But I think in a lot of other areas, the FAA doesn't. So that, that is open. There was one in the back. So I have, uh, I know some people that are doing the freelance photography with you know, first person view crafts. Sure. And they, they talk about using, uh, there's loopholes out there. Like you can go to regular photography and wedding and skip away your hobby craft footage of the wedding for free. And I guess I'm wondering if you have any experience with those loopholes that come Again, those are fact specific. The question was, is there a loophole available there in aerial photography that would make it such that if you're conducting an aerial uh, photography business but doing the aerial photography for free, would that make it such that you're exempt under the hobby and recreational exemption? Um, my, my gut reaction is no. I love how you worded that question. <laughs> I am, and I said, I have a friend who has perfect. <laughs> I'm not wearing a wire. <laughs> uh, but, it, look, if I was going to get into a UAV business, uh, I, personally, I, I love the aerial photography aspect of this business. I have, absolutely love the quadcopters and, and what you see with first person view stuff. I sit there and watch YouTube videos all day long. It's fantastic that people are doing these things. So I certainly want to see the business flourish, but probably that's an FAA issue, and the, we haven't seen it come up in the litigation context yet. But if the FAA was looking at a potential violation, they would look at um, what we always call the totality of the circumstances, and in the totality of the circumstances, you might find yourself standing in wet cement. Well, I guess how, how are these people getting away with filming more commercials? Because I know a couple guys that. How are, they, how are they getting away with doing aerial photography and footage right now? Well, a couple different ways. One, doing it outside the United States, of course, right? Um, but another way is that the FAA just doesn't have the enforcement uh, mechanism in place right now to do anything about it. 
Um, you're certainly running risk. Um, no one's going to tell you that there's not a risk involved. Um, but that the FAA just doesn't have the people involved to try and run around. But the more you stick your neck out there, we have actually seen that happen. Patrick can tell you this. We have seen it happen where the FAA has stepped in to someone who's so flagrant, so out there with both their advertising and their operations that the FAA has in fact stepped in. Um, so it's not that it's legal. It's not that the FAA is condoning it. They just don't have the mechanism to run around and get everyone taking pictures for money using the UAV. Yeah, a few months ago, I saw it uh, on the, uh, the Smithsonian Channel. The great piece on the history of South Carolina from Charleston up in the mountains. And it was some of the most incredible area of the park I've ever seen. They were throwing little glimpses of a multi rotor uh, vehicle in there. And yeah, this was on uh, cable TV. How, how would they have avoided the flag? You know, I don't know off the top of my head, and I didn't read about that Smithsonian piece. I was dying to see it. But I can tell you that they may have been able to get a COA by, um, because it's educational in nature, and the Smithsonian, to the extent that it's a nonprofit museum, you can just get a COA and do it that way. Um, that's my guess if they're doing it above board. I don't think that the Smithsonian is running around intentionally breaking any rules. But that, that's how I would have done it the Smithsonian. How are we doing on time? Oh, you're not letting me have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're doing uh, we're good. We're good. And, and the conversation is great. I'd like to keep this rolling. John? Do you think that um, sort of using, using the recreational rules for promotional practice is that work? Is defensible? Uh, I have seen examples where I've uh, I kind of bantered that about in my own head. So that probably is defensible if it's if it's promotional, but not for a business that you're operating now. That's a, that's a hard thing. It's one thing to go out and do your own photography. I, I could go out today and go take a thousand pictures, but wait a few years before I actually engage in the business of selling those pictures. Um, but if that link is too close between capturing those pictures and actually sell them, then I'm going to find myself in a, a problematic area. And I guess a, a follow-on to that would be uh, how, you know, we've spoken a lot about business and education and science and defense, but how about in the realm of art? You know, because some of what has been going on, I mean, like you said, you spend a lot of time watching these videos on YouTube and, and the, you know, there's, there's questions to whether, again, you know, the, the, the line between what's a hobby and what's a business is a hobby is oftentimes just an unsuccessful business. And, and so, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you don't have to be making a profit to be running a business. <laughs> and, and, and even the IRS has a category for what they call a passive loss limitation, which is that if you're engaged in something that's not actually your primary income, it's not actually considered a business, and so there are limits to how it's considered. So, you know, again, Working in that gray area, what kind of advice in terms of you know promoting what you're doing as art versus a business and so on? I don't know if, that's um, if you did find yourself on the, the wrong end of an FAA investigation, let's say, I would take all that information you just said as an, as a ramrod, put it in my rifle, and get ready to shoot it back in, in my defense and say, hey, look, here are the facts. I'm not actually operating a business. This is my hobby, um, and I, I think you'd probably be on more stable ground there because you have the facts to back you. Let's go a little bit deeper into the FAA end of it. And uh, I think we all know that the FAA doesn't make regulations. They are uh, an administrator of policy. Yeah. And uh, it's been bantered about that uh, with the current FARs that and they've even admitted it, that unmanned aircraft aren't covered under the bar. So because of that, we're going to ground everyone. So we've, we've heard that for a very long time. And, and now without any real specific bars that address unmanned aircraft, the administration of that policy has come into question. And I was uh, wondering, in your opinion, people have said that if they really don't have any teeth, 
to, to go out and bite you with because they really have no regulations because they don't fit into what we're doing with unmanned aircraft. Um, I know that that dialogue has been bantered down, okay. um, but I don't actually put a whole lot of faith in that dialogue to try and, and, and say because of uh, a little bit of unique chicanery that the FAA doesn't have the authority to regulate what they say are aircraft. Um, if, if, unfortunately, if we're not happy with the broad definition of aircraft, that's a pretty expansive definition. Well, definitions tend to be pretty pliable these days. Yeah. yeah, but the authority for them to be able to enforce that definition also makes it pliable in a direction that favors their interpretation. Uh, I've looked at that analysis that you're talking about, and uh, I don't, uh, I wouldn't invest a whole lot in it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're on, we're on track, right? Yeah. We're on track <laughs> to get regulations. Um, so to try and pretend that you know, we're filling up the apple cart and we're moving along and then trying to pretend that we can just throw out the apple cart now probably might not be a great move. That we press on. The regulations won't come soon enough for me or for most people in this room. Yeah. One last one. are enforcement actions against that person's certificate. But if we're talking about uncertificated operators, and that might go to your point a little bit, well, what can you do to me? I don't have a certificate. But they do have civil penalty options available to them. So that's what you'd be looking at. If you're not actually a certificated operator and they can't threaten your certificate, then their next best option is civil penalties. And that's what they would look at.